Welcome to the Loadout Music Podcast, featuring intimate conversations with emerging and established musicians, recorded at the Gaslight Studios in St. Louis. And now your host, Aaron Perlin. Welcome back to another episode of the Loadout Music Podcast, presented by Wellbeing Brewing and Shinesty. I'm your host, Aaron Perlin, and today I'm joined by the lead singer of a band you may not know, but if you're a fan of the hit show Sons of Anarchy, you've probably at least heard the Quaker City Nighthawks out of Fort Worth, Texas. It's a band that I really dig, and I'm certain you will, and I'm thrilled to be joined by one of the band's founders and lead singer, Sam Anderson. Sam, thanks so much for making time for this today. Hey, thanks so much for having me on here, man. Really, really uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, man, so... so you know, there's a lot of things I want to get to, just everything from how, you know, COVID's impacting, what the band is doing. But tell me, you know, I know the, I know the band was founded back in, I think, 2009. Um, just what, tell me about the band's story and how you came together. I know that, you know, you, you've, kind of, you've kind of done the road that every, every musician's got to, got to go down and, uh, you know, played coffee houses and things like that. But uh, how did this band come together? Um, basically, uh, David and I met here in, in Lubbock, Texas, uh, while we were going to school out there. Uh, I was at Texas Tech. Um, I was in art school out there, and uh, David was at South Plains Bluegrass College, which is uh, right there in Loveland, just uh, kind of in the immediate Lubbock area. We met through a mutual friend, and like I said, kind of the only scene right there for us, or at least... I know for me to uh, kind of break into is the coffee shop scene. That was the least place to get a time slot. So I think that's kind of how we first wound up both hearing each other's music and just hanging out from there. Um, you know, uh, who knows we're playing back then. <laughs> Probably, you know, I'm sure so, uh, you know, the Highway catalog covers, you know, running through all that stuff, you know, uh, trying to be Wilco or Rydams or whatever you do when you're in college. But um, he wound up moving to Austin, and I moved back to Fort Worth. Uh, something came up. I had a place, an extra room open. He moved into Fort Worth, and uh, just being around each other constantly, you know, uh, just writing, it just seemed like the next progression. So, you know, kind of start melding some stuff together. So we made our foray into playing live music together and getting stuff thrown at us at first. So. So, so I, you know, it's funny. I I first heard you. Uh, I think I was listening to Outlaw Country on uh, on on Sirius XM, and I I, I uh, you know, and I heard uh, one of the songs off your yeah. your relatively new album, and um, and I'm like, Quaker City Nighthawks. Where the hell are they? Are they, are they from Pennsylvania? Are they Quakers? And then I, you know, I, I kind of dug in and, and, and did some research <laughs> on you. I'm like, these guys are from Texas. And, you know, the more I listened to it, I could, I could kind of feel that kind of that, that Texas rock sound. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen people compare your music to, or at least influences it to bands like ZZ Top and, and, and Led Zeppelin. Um, but what, where, where would you say, what really inspires the band? Where do you, you know, it's, it's so hard to define a band sound, but when I think about you guys, you guys are just like a pure rock and roll band to me. Uh, yeah, I think whenever we, if people ask us what kind of band, I just tell them rock and roll, but you know, that's kind of an all encompassing term. But uh, I think a big, all of our influences definitely are a lot of the, you know, the big rock and roll bands come out of Texas before us. Uh, Obviously, Z Top uh, stuff like that, but just um, just the kind of blues that that kind of that band. And you know, if you ever had Z Top their blues band, they'd probably scream "God no," uh, because there's some some pretty legit blues bands in Texas that would probably have something to say about that uh, a more traditional style of blues. But um, just the the way they you know uh, their attitude towards Dick, um, just the the not just the writing style, but the way that permeated their whole, you know, being, uh, that kind of that working man sound, you know, uh, uh, we're trying to put as, as, as few slashes as possible, uh, when people drive, but you know, um, I don't, it really bother me how people 
to describe it or they came to it. You know, a lot of people come to music from from the tree scene, you know, because uh, that's very important here in Texas. And now people kind of slide over into our music, and that's perfectly fine with me. Some people come, we've done tours with, you know, Corrosion of Confinity and, and Crowbar. And so we get some bands that come into us from the heavier side of music. And, and I don't know, I feel like if we touch enough of the places, it's kind of like easier to gather people from all, all uh, not just walks of life, but genres of reference too. And it, I've heard, I, I think I read a Rolling Stone review of, um, of your latest record, and it's, it's always interesting because I guess you have a, you, you've got some, the band's got a fascination with, uh, with sci-fi, clearly, and UFOs. Um, but uh, I, I, I think I read a quote from you saying that you kind of just got tired of sometimes people calling you a, a country band because it really isn't what you guys are at all, and it's not. If you you know if you spend some time listening to your catalog, you pretty quickly realize you're not a country band. Sorry, I lost you there for just a second. Can yeah. I just, just repeat that? Yeah, of course, of course. Of course, it's breaking up. Yeah, um, I, I I read a Rolling Stone review on your your most recent album, and. Uh, I think it quoted you as saying almost, I don't know if it was frustration is the right term, but you talked about how you kind of, with certain audiences, you got tired of having to dispel the notion of being a, a country band because you're really not, which I thought was kind of funny that there's an assumption that because you guys are from Texas, that you're, you're some type of country band. When again, you know, you guys are, you guys are a rock and roll band. Hey, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's, uh, we always joke uh, we get uh, genre-fied because we have hats. And, you know, uh, if we just quit wearing these cowboy hats, maybe they, we quit getting put in the, that genre. But like I said, that happens, and, you know, uh, looks can be deceiving. Uh, uh, I understand, you know, we, we get the funny thing, but we'll be walking around a town before we're playing, you know, sampling local, you know, shops and wherever we go, record stores. Somebody told me to be like, you look like Richard Skinner. And I was like, that's five, six different people, not just one person, but I appreciate it. And however you into it is fine. But yeah, we had to make a concerted effort not to get stuck in the genre of of country or of, of you know, garage rock or indie rock or heavy music. You know, we, we, we love playing all those different genres and it's very much a part of who we are, but we never wanted to get stuck just milling around one and, 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 and let that genre define who we are band. And, you know, I know your father was, a, is a minister and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the hat you're wearing and, uh, I, I, I take it that faith is, is a, is an important part of your life. Uh, yes. And, um, well, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's a little more complicated. I we definitely grew up, uh, religious grew up. Uh, my father was a Church of Christ preacher, and with with all that comes the uh, you know acapella worship services where you know you sing without instruments and and really had a huge influence on music I created. Uh, I feel like more today, at least content as lyrically, um, it's coming from more of a place of of. Uh, I don't want to say sitting review, but um, wistful hindsight, you know, kind of looking back on things and and realizing maybe some of the stuff taught in the church, this this holy way of growing up, maybe some of that stuff wasn't exactly accurate. Maybe a lot of it doesn't really, uh, you know, capiche with, with uh, how you lived in 2020. And I think, you know, with that just completely, you know, throwing it to the wind, I think religious people i think religion is very important for a lot of people i think it's a lot of people um you know develop a code for the way they want to live and the, the way they think they should live but there's a lot of you know really kind of experience you get out of growing up in that and seeing how that religion can be twisted and parted and abused to to make people either feel or or completely marginalize an entire set of human beings and I think um, that's kind of where I'm 
I'm coming from more now today writing about it than, you know, maybe when I was in my teen years. Do you, do you find that you end up writing music about how your perspective is evolving, having grown up in a, you know, a pretty fundamentally religious household and now obviously having a, a different worldview of, of organized religion and kind of living in this rock and roll world that you live in where you're on the road, you're at bars, playing clubs. Um, ha have you found that you've tried to explore in your songwriting that evolution of your mindset? Uh, absolutely. Um, just me, I think just out on the road and, you know, we've been so much of the last five, six years of our lives traveling. Um, but during that, you get to meet people from all kinds of different backgrounds that have, that have you know, uh, a lot of musicians have grown up in the church. A lot, that, a lot of times that's uh, musicians' first exposure to music, their first time to uh, engage in music. Uh, and so I meet a lot of people that have very similar backgrounds to me. I also meet people with wildly different backgrounds to me. And I, all of that has kind of shaped just the way, at least I personally view, uh, I, don't, I can't speak for Dave, other songwriter, um, but I, I know he grew up very similar to me too. And we've talked length about just kind of how now we view religion and, and, and the ways that it's used in our society, vastly different than how we, we did coming to uh, being songwriters. So I think we definitely uh, speak on that more and, and especially more in now these, these, what seems like, you know, the crazy times in our lives. And I think uh, that's a hyperbole anymore, but uh, definitely seem to be zeroing in more on that stuff. And, and uh, you know, the, the list of important things kind of get dwindles, dwindled down uh, whenever you're up against it, like everyone is right now. So, um, yeah, just in the all seeing scene of how to live a better life or how to uh, get rid of stuff that didn't make you live a better life uh, definitely crops up in songwriting days. And now a quick word from one of our valued sponsors. Have you ever been the town drunk? Come on, give yourself more credit than that. At the very least, you've embarrassed not only yourself, but your better half at some type of party or gathering. And guess what? For about 30 years, I was that guy. This guy. Always too much to drink, always the worst. But I love the taste of beer. Not crap macro beer, but real beer. Which is why I drink Wellbeing's Hellraiser Amber and its IPA. They're the only high-quality craft non-alcoholic beers in the market and a proud sponsor of The Loadout. Visit wellbeingbrewing.com and use the code LOADOUT at checkout for a discount. Now back to me doing my best to ruin what should be a great experience with our amazing guest. So, so you grew up, you know, singing, playing music in church. At what point do you start to explore kind of what has shaped Sam Anderson today um, in terms of, you know, your rock and roll spirit? What, you know, did you start playing out at a young age or you just mess around with the guitars Did your parents buy you a guitar when you were young? How did, how did that rock and roll dream start in your life? Um, I was, I, you know, always music around the house. Uh, like I said, growing up in Christ, there's no instruments uh, in the worship service. It was all just singing. Uh, and there's, you know, very views from the Church of Christ, whether that's right or wrong or not. You know, there's people that are hard in the paint, no interest in worship. And now that we've gotten into this modern age of, of uh, you know, it, uh, always want to include everyone, uh, there's, there's services with instruments. But we kind of fell on the latter sect where, you know, kind of thought the interpretation of the verses that said no instruments were a little red and archaic and Therefore, my parents had a pretty wide music taste, you know, and, and I think a lot of people get this from their parents, too. But my parents grew up listening to, you know, basically, like, my father more 70s rock and roll, but my mother, you know, really good 70s AM gold stuff, like Linda Ronstadt and Carol King. And, and uh, that accompanied, you know, my dad listening to, to you know, anywhere from Easy Top to 
even further obscure Texas band there, like the Greasy Wheels and, and uh, you know, uh, anything in that genre. I got exposed at a young age. I didn't start playing guitar until 18. Um, my dad played guitar, you know, like with any sort of mass proficiency, just, you know, fool around on the guitar a little bit and play, you know, maybe some Roger Miller songs and make up his own lyrics. And then my mother was a, a beautiful uh, pianist and uh, she sang very well too. So being close to them and seeing their love for music, uh, whether it be my mom performing and, and playing piano or my father just listening to it, but that kind of started putting the bug in my ear. And then once I started putting the guitar with it, uh, I think it was kind of a uh, ever-growing snowball from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm I'm always fascinated by just how hard it is to make it in the music business because, I mean, you guys have been at this, you know, 11 years now. You were founded in 2009. You've got, uh, what, five five records out. Um, uh, you know, you, you're, you're signed to a, a pretty well-regarded Nashville label. Um, but it's so hard, especially, you know, what's happened over the last six months to become, to be, to become a household name. And there's so many talented, talented people who have never even had a sniff of, of success or notoriety, uh, how do, how do you look at kind of growing this career and, and ultimately getting where you want to get to? Uh, that's a question. I think everyone has a different um, definition of making it or whatever. Um, you know, we've been this for a decade now. And uh, in band years, I think 70 years. I don't know. <laughs> I think we age like dogs or, or maybe virus. But um We've been at it for a long time, and, and, you know, there's these different little check marks I have, you know. I remember when we first started playing, uh, you know, Texas specifically, playing Green Hall was a bucket list, thing, you know. Um, when we first started playing, just travel outside the city we lived in to play a show it seemed like a huge thing. You know, I think the first time we played outside of Texas was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and that was basically a national tour in our brains. But... Um, I think it's kind of a one of those things where the goal kind of, you know, the goalposts get moved a lot. Uh, you know, once once you reach a certain level, um, like uh, first time signed with a label, and we had label support, you know, going into the record, and, and we got to sit down and figure out a studio we wanted to go to. That's at the time a very normal move. Five years previous from that, my have exploded that we had that opportunity so uh when you kind of move at the pace we move you know <clears throat> stuff that gets normalized and, and you're not really ever seeing it as making it. you kind of seeing it as or we haven't made it, we're making it if that makes sense um and and the process is kind of what you love and i know kind of the thing that drives you mad sometimes is is there's a lot of up and weight in the music industry, and and this next one is is your time where everything's gonna explode. But within my experience, it's been you know a slow gathering of of supporters, rather than just this you know fall of overnight success. We had we had an article come out in our town. Uh, we just got our first tour, and we got a Rolling Stone ride or something like that, and big an article written that you know. We were an overnight success. I just kept thinking in my head, yeah, yeah, ten year overnight success. Uh, that doesn't really uh, go together. We're uh, we're talking to Sam Anderson for the Quaker City Nighthawks, and we're going to pause for a quick break and message from one of our sponsors. All right, Sam, I'm just going to come back into it real fast, and then uh, I'll ask you another question. Sounds we're good. We're back with Sam Anderson from the Quaker City Nighthawks. This is the Loadout Music Podcast. I'm Aaron Perlett. So, Sam, before the break, we were, you know, talking about the climb and, you know, the challenges of the climb and how you've kind of moved the goalposts a little bit. And and I think you referenced an article that said you were you guys were kind of an overnight success. And 
it's pretty remarkable that I think what what a lot of music fans don't get is that especially that that first album is usually a batch of songs that you've been working on and playing out for years and years and years and fine tuning that and they don't get just how many times you've played those songs out to to get to that first record i mean is that uh, does that just amaze you how long you've got to just work at the craft even just on this the you know your first batch of songs absolutely you know uh when we had when we first started as a band, the first recording we ever did, uh, we kind of backed into a uh, buddy of ours, Zach Bell, is a sound engineer at a bar that we played at all the time, Fort Worth, called the Moon Bar, and uh, we'd only been a band for maybe six weeks when he offered to record us. Now the thing is with that, David and I have been playing those songs that we've been playing in the band for six. We'd, we'd been playing those songs for years you know where some of them had been three or four years old or some of them were relatively new david and i had been doing them for a long time but we kind of thrust in the studio on that record we had a really opportunity uh to be honest with you the price point was something we could afford uh, at the time which was next to nothing but we kind of that first album on torquila torquila we're kind of from the fire there and and you know we hadn't played those songs much now with every album we're not really good at uh, waiting to play a song live until it comes out the official single release or something like that. So as soon as David and I have a new song and it's complete, we'll start playing it at shows. And I feel like it's helped our recording immensely. Um, having number one live feedback playing in front of somebody and 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 you can see if song if people like this song or like this song almost immediately. And um, then also how much the songs change over time, playing them live in front of people. Tales will change, um, you know, whole sections of songs will get reordered. Uh, I think it's really great creative process to have songs, like you said, and play them 150 times at show before you get into the studio. And then when you get in the studio, you're that much more confident of how the song needs to go. I think first album, there was a lot of guesswork on, uh, uh, on, on how things should sound and, and uh, should be layered. And um, I, I think a lot of that was was fun. You know, I think after the spontaneity of the moment, I much prefer uh, test songs out and, you know, in the wild before you get into the studio to kind of turn them into what you want them to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, yeah, it's such a, it's such a hard road <laughs> I mean, being, being a musician's tough. I mean, because you, you do, but I'm sure there's there's a real, um, as you were saying, there's a real joy when you are when you're playing out songs in front of an audience and you get that feedback you're looking for, and it kind of in your in your mind it it reaffirms this song you've been grinding on and, and putting your passion into and thinking about, and you think to yourself, God damn, this is a great song. And then you hear 500 people that are clapping and, you know, going crazy. It, it, that's got to be like one of when you talked about moving the goalposts, that must be one of those early wins you're really looking for, isn't it? That you just you want to hear that crowd just kind of going crazy for these these songs you've been just culling for years. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I, you know, speaking specifically to the crowd response, the first time we, we got to go play in Europe, was uh, opening up Blackberry Smoke. And these are definitely some of the biggest shows we'd played to date, and especially for our first time in Europe. It was, you know, such a great experience. They've been playing over there for years now and have built a very little following. So uh, we knew we were kind of in the same genres. We didn't know what to expect as far as how the European crowd would handle us, you know, uh, if they enjoyed it or if it was, you know, weird amount. We had a clue. And, uh, we got to Germany for the first date, and uh, we were running a little bit behind schedule, um, dealing with, you know, the culture shock of being thrust into a new uh, a country you've never been to before, coupled with you not sure how you're not sure if you know how your pedal boy gonna work with you know and electricity, and and not sure the gear that you've rented over there is gonna be to your liking, and very flustered and did get a full check and 
I'll never forget we played the Sprite of Miguel the Scare, which is uh, been a song we've put on a couple albums. One of the songs we've probably played the most as a band. And as we hit into the chorus, the entire crowd of 1,100 people or however we were there all sang the chorus and listened back to us. And it almost got me down while we were playing and I almost come back in and, and sing the rest of the chorus because I was just so taken back by it. I looked over at David and he kind of gave me the looks. He's like, well, keep playing, motherfucker. We, you know, the song's still on. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was, like I said, definitely uh, a huge moment for me is being on the other side of the world and someone singing your song back to you was just, you know, earth shattered to me at that point. Yeah, that's I, I can only imagine that's pretty cool. Um, so your guy's name, you know, I, I mentioned this before, how when I first heard you, I was like, where the hell are these guys from? Um, my understanding is that the the Quaker City Nighthawks name came from, uh, or at least partially came from Mark Twain's uh, travel book, The Innocence Abroad. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, yeah, that was a, uh, I was personally a big Mark Twain fan. Uh, grew up reading it. Uh, father was a big fan and I've got everything. I've got a full library of, of Mark Twain stuff, but I uh, was going through that book and, and the way I really, I like Mark Twain a lot because he speaks about kind of what I eventually go on to do with my life is traveling around. And book he's on uh, he's working for a newspaper and they had uh, paid for him to go on this pleasure cruise that was kind of hitting a lot of places in the holy land uh, you know going to jerusalem and and uh, also other stuff on the trip but it was with mainly populated mainly with a um, fairly religious uh, group of people that were going on the trip and he was having a hard time finding people that he could actually you know, let loose with and maybe smoke some cigars, have some drinks, play some cards. Uh, and he finally found a group of people that they eat in secret on this cruise and kind of go below deck. Everyone had gone to bed and said theirs or whatever. And uh, they could kind of cut loose, you know, and they, could, they didn't have to feel restrained by acting appropriately just in front of their other religious uh, uh, friends. So the ship that they were on was, the, was a decommissioned warship called the SS Quaker City. And the group of people that may not have to play cards uh, were the Nighthawks. So at the time of us forming our band, Ian and I were, were definitely going through the the process of, of uh, evaluating our religious upbringing and, and, and what of those values did we want to continue on and what did we want to leave behind. And that just seemed like a very apropos uh, title for what we're doing. We're talking to Sam Anderson of the Quaker City Nighthawks. We're going to take a quick pause for this word from one of our sponsors. All right, Sam, I'm going to come back in just like we did before. This will be the last one of these, okay? All righty. And we're back with Sam Anderson, founder and lead singer of the Quaker City Nighthawks out of Fort Worth, Texas. So Sam, um, I gotta ask, you know, in 2016, you guys put out El Astronauta, which was, you know, a very uh, almost like a concept album um, <laughs> about UFOs, and and uh, it seems like uh, I guess you and you and David are uh, are big sci-fi fans. Is that uh, is that an accurate reading? Uh, absolutely. We are both very big sci-fi fans. That's kind of why that got in that setting rather than uh, the real world. <laughs> What's, uh, what, what do you love? What's, are, you, are you a movie guy, book guy, what? Uh, we like all of it. You know, uh, I think at the time, David and I were both reading a lot of uh, sci-fi. Uh, we'd always been fans of the movies. I think that's really a lot of people's foray into that genre, but, uh, you know, reading a lot of Asimov and 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 stuff like that, uh, stuff along those lines, and and just kind of uh, really enjoy the dealing with issues that are current, but also how those play out 
hundreds of years in advance or, or into the future. And um, specifically the stuff we were dealing on that album, there's a lot of uh, kind of, uh, it's the guise of space travel, or, you know, dealing with immigration reform under the guise of space travel. Um, dealing with issues that we deal with, us living down here in Texas and um, uh, with the border issues and uh, uh, concerns that people have over that here and, and how uh, making imaginary line people can't cross uh, is kind of seems like, you know, a, a wild thing to cling to and, and seeing that has been clung to so hard, what would look like in the future, people are colonizing space and there's people that aren't allowed to go to space or, or they can't cross the imaginary, imaginary boundary into uh, another fictitious place where they can't live and uh, just showing how insane that looks and how words that is saying even in the future when there's travel i think it kind of reiterates how ridiculous it sounds in 2020 and now a quick word from one of our sponsors have you ever wanted a tightly wrapped american flag around your waist with a giant bald eagle face placed squarely on your junk or how about a steve harvey coronavirus mask or maybe the next evolution of jorts in the form of a hot and sexy denim speedo. But maybe, just maybe, you're dying for a pair of Kansas City Chiefs overalls or even leopard pants. Yes, 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 and most definitely, yes. And it's all pretty easily found at Shinesty, the perfectly weird party gear website that I find myself escaping to every time I need a mental break from the miserable 2020 we've been having. So check out our new sponsor at Shinesty.com. That's the word shine sty.com and use the code loadout15 that's loadout15 at checkout. Now back to this less than spectacular show. You know, you seem like you spend a lot of time thinking about uh, philosophy, which is not unusual for anyone who has been brought up in, in a religious background. And I'm curious, you know, right now uh we're going through just a remarkable period of time in this country where, you know, not only are we locked down as a, as a nation and being asked to wear masks and to stay at home and to distance from people we love and not being able to play out, but, you know, we're also going through um, a, a remarkable time as it relates to, to race in this country and how human beings are treated. And I know there's been a lot of conversation uh, in the entertainment world um, about this. And I'm curious if you have any, any, any feelings about, you know, either what's going on from a, from a health and safety standpoint or, or, or socially right now, because there are so many important issues that are, that are being discussed on a regular basis. And, and, you know, we're trying to evolve as a people, obviously. Absolutely. You know, and, and the music community has always been one, uh, I feel like, to spend minds on issues like that. And I think that's important to, um, to not stay in your lane. I, I, I hate that term so bad, uh, just hearing stay in your lane because it's all of our lanes. Uh, you know, public well being is all of our lane. Uh, whether you're a musician or an accountant or, or, or an attorney or a doctor or whatever, uh, that's something we that all care about. And I think right now, what's coming down to is, is, Lives aren't being valued. Uh, whether it be black lives, um, or or you know, our teachers are sending back to school, students that we're sending back to school to test out to see if this works. Um, I think there's a deep disconnect in care for human life right now, and I think that's one of the most terrifying uh, advances I've seen in society. Would be during the pandemic, or or uh, would be with the Black Lives Matter rallies and, and the press that are going on right now, it's very clear to us that a certain section of our population does not care about the lives of others. Like whether that being the lives and health and safety of, of the general population or the fact that black people being killed in an overwhelmingly larger rate than anyone else in this country. And I think that's something I don't want to be quiet about it. I don't think people should be quiet about it. And I'm uh, very impressed, you know, to, to speak out about whether it be in my music, which is certainly my lane, or whether it be out of my 
music, which which is not mine, but uh, I think it's important to speak out on it, and and I think a lot of musicians feel the same way. You know, I, I think I'm reminded of this another Texas band, albeit a very different band from from the Quaker City Nighthawks, uh, the Chicks the artist formerly known as Dixie Chicks. Uh, they have a new record out right now. Uh, you know, they're, everyone knows they're, they are a Texas band. Um, but basically, you know, uh, I, I want to say more than a decade ago, they, they kind of had their career snatched out from underneath them, at least for a short term, after they had so, sold you know, more than 30 million albums um, because Natalie Maines spoke out at a concert in the U.K., criticizing President Bush and all of a sudden country radio uh, wanted nothing to do with them and, and they, they they were blacklisted. Do you ever worry that you know as you guys are are on the rise and you're getting better known and building you know building an audience not only in the US but globally do you ever worry that getting back to your stay in your lane comment that, you need to be cautious about what you're saying or is your attitude, you know, fuck it. I'm, I'm going to tell people what I think and they can either accept me or in this band, or they can not accept us and, and leave us by the wayside. Um, I don't, I don't worry about it. I try not to, I don't ever want to speak out of fear. Uh, I also never want to not speak out of fear. Um, and I think it's, I mean, that being said, I'm, I'm not, you know, 100% brave. There's definitely, you're always worried about your career. You know, there's always something, especially in today's culture, there's always something, you know, that could get you wrong. And um, I think if it's something you believe in, it doesn't matter. Uh, if it's something that, that you feel compelled to say, uh, I don't want to be uh, cautious out of fear. I want to be, you know, bold in the face of fear. And, and there's so many people that could lose so much more than just a career speaking out. Um, there's, there's literally people that have lost their lives for speaking out. So to me, um, you know, I, I'm very proud of career and, and the career that Quaker City has, has developed to and, and the band that they developed. But I'm even more proud that, that we do stand up for things that we think are important and that we're not basing every decision on is this going to lose us fans? It's going to, you know, what are the numbers say? Uh, you know, is this what we're supposed to be doing right now? Is this, this going to help us look better in the eyes of the general public? And uh, I don't think for a second hesitate. And I, I know David is the same way to uh, speak out on something that we truly believe in at the cost of whatever to our career. You know, um, we started music because we, we had, something we felt we wanted to say in a certain way we wanted to say and if you lose that out of out of fear of of you know adversary reactions i think you've lost the reason that you're doing it so um let's move over speaking of staying in the lane let's move let's why don't uh you know i i brought us down this road of uh philosophical death let's uh, let's get into some of your music and I want to talk about your most recent album that came out last year, QCNH, um, where you actually, uh, one of my favorite songs on the album is called Fox in the Hen House, which, which actually, my understanding is, uh, came off of your second album, Honcho. Um, but talk a little bit about this album. I had read that you had said, uh, talked about, I know, I know you've had some turnover in the band outside of you and David. But you had talked about having a completely different set of weapons um, and how it's opened more doors for you. And I imagine you meant, you know, musically in terms of the 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 lineup. So um, talk to me about how the band has evolved from when you founded the band, when you and David found the band in 2009 to to now with your latest release uh, from last year. So we've had a few lineup choose. Um... The, the, the core songwriting has been always David and myself, and uh, we've been lucky to share the road and, and some, some albums with a lot of really, really good musicians. Um, the original rep was uh, David and myself, as well as Patrick Evans on bass and Matt Mabe on drums. And um, 
you know, as as it happens when you're at something for 10 years, especially something as, as uh, you know, taxing as, as being on half the year, traveling a lot, and a lot of times making a whole lot of money, um, people tend to go different ways or, or you know, they're, they're done with it. And we had another band member, Aaron Hayes, <clears throat> who we just had a child. And, uh, um, and now we have a new drummer, Jordan Richardson, who uh, I've been friends with for a long time and previous bands with. Uh, I was in a, like a little psych rock band with him called Epic Ones that uh, he started kind of around the same time as uh, Quaker City and more of a, there's 15 people in that band. So it's more of a, a, a very occasion that we play. But you know, now having Jordan in the band, uh, his skill set is, is he has such a wide range of music that he can play and he's such a talented drummer uh, you know he been, you know played with ben harper for quite a long time and uh you know he like, won a grammy you know producing on the charlie and white album uh played drums with ray star you know and when the beatles drummer had to play drums that means you're doing something right but uh now going to the studio with him is also an engineer and he has his own studio and uh, we're, we're planning on recording right now. David and I have been, uh, you know, not a lot to do but write right now, especially in the music industry. And going into the studio with him, I feel like we have so more options on what we do and <clears throat> how how weird we want to get or, you know, how uh, how different we want to use certain sound. And, and having him there to facilitate all that has been huge. And also from a writing standpoint, you know, uh, he has his own music, uh, his own solo project called Enough Stan. And uh, it's completely different than Quaker's completely different style of music, but he's a, the main songwriter in that in that vessel. And that brings a lot to the table too, just rather feel like I'm just bouncing ideas off of a, a drummer. I'm, I'm collaborating with another songwriter. And him having tools he has being such an excellent musician performatively uh, his brain creative, creatively is is just as sharp. Uh, you know that's that's all we feel like we go in, when we go to the studio. Whoever's there, we play to the strengths of the people there, and that kind of informs your songwriting style. And, and a lot of people don't want to change style for anything. It's all like this, and no matter who's on the record, it'll, it'll sound like this. But I, I really enjoy the, the nuance and the certain fingerprint you get on it by by the people that you're working currently, whether that be the engineer you're working with or different members in the band. We've got, you know, uh, Maxwell Smith playing bass with now, and he's very young, much younger than a lot of us in the band, but having his new set of eyes and stuff and having a uh, young person perspective, starting, even issues that we deal with and, and uh, uh, content wise, you know, lyrically, uh, it's just really good to have those different uh, opinions and different views on stuff and like I said I really enjoy going into the studio with 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 different people and, and figuring out what are our strengths as a group and how can we make you know the sum of the parts you know greater than the whole all right well you know I, I gotta imagine you, you you touched on this when you were talking about uh the new lineup but <clears throat> There isn't a whole lot for musicians to do today other than to, you know, privately hone your craft. Um, what's what's your expect? I mean, you know, the last six, eight months have just been, we've all been locked down. What is your expectation? Are you guys working on a record? Are you just waiting for this to, things to lighten up so you can kind of hit the road again? I mean, you guys are, are notorious for just being out on the road. Um constantly so what's yeah tell me about this period of time and what your hope is next at least um yeah i mean we're, we're definitely right now we're we're recording a re like we're going to be recording a full album and um uh right it was kind of the time we had prepared to do this anyway uh before uh covid happened before all of this happened um kind of this time of the year, we're going to plan to start recording, get working on the new album. We always have a yearly trip in the fall to uh, Europe where we go on tour for usually about a month and a half, two months. 
that's obviously not happening this year. Um, we're having stuff fur- further out, you know, you know, nowadays we've got stuff on the schedule a year in advance, sometimes for their, and we're already seeing stuff in spring of 21, you know, fall by the wayside. And, and I think it's hard now. And I think it's almost fool's air to even put a date on when we think and get back out and safely do what we do. Uh, with that being said, it's like half, it's like losing half of limbs, uh, sometimes more than half of your limbs in our, uh, we very much pride ourselves on our, our live show and, and, you know, recording was kind of this secondary beat that we had to learn how to tame so we could play more live shows. And now that we've done it five times and recorded, we're much comfortable in the studio and I feel it's getting to the level where we're getting as the studio as we are at the live show. Uh, we just played so many more live shows than we recorded albums. You know, it's hard to, to even those out. But right now, I, I look at the positive and, and it really is a time where I think we can buckle down and and kind of figure out how we work in the studio better right now. That's really all we can do. And you know, minus the few live streams here, and there, but uh, I think it's a real time for us to, to come and turn in the studio and, and we start to feel comfortable in there and really start to put out albums and and recordings that match the intensity and the, the sound of the live show. Yeah, I imagine it's frustrating. Well, Sam Anderson of the Quaker City Nighthawks, thank you so much for being on the Loadout Music Podcast. We really appreciate you uh, you being on here. Hopefully, you guys will be able to hit the road and maybe come to St. Louis, and we can do uh, one of these live in the Gaslight Studios, and you guys can also play a little bit of music for us. But, uh, Sam, thanks so much for being a guest. Our thanks to our our uh, sponsors, Shinesty and Wellbeing Brewing, and... We hope you tune in next time for another edition of the Loadout Music Podcast. Thanks again, Sam. Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Can't get up there to St. Lumo. Love it up there. (laughs) Hey, folks, if you made it this far and judging by our numbers, you haven't. Thanks for listening to the Loadout Music Podcast. You can always find us at loadoutmusic.com and then wherever you like to get your podcasts like iTunes or SoundCloud. And of course, as always, thanks to Gaslight Studios for hosting us. Have a good one.